stocks, bonds, ETFs, straight out of downtown Chicago. This is Zach's Market Edge. Welcome to Zach's Market Edge, the podcast about investing in your life. I'm your host, Tracy Reinick, and this week I'm joined by Zach's senior strategist, Kevin Cook, to look at what the famous money managers were doing during the coronavirus sell-off, what was happening with some of our favorite stocks, were people diving in, did they get any deals, were they getting out of certain names, did they miss the March lows, or did they get in there that's kind of a trick question. We don't for sure know if they got in exactly at the March lows, but we can we can uh, draw our own conclusions. Um, Kevin, we've talked about these 13 F filings, and that happens 45 days after the end of the prior quarter. And we did just do one of these episodes in February, I think it was, of this year. But that was for Q4 when everything was roses, let's just say. And now we have the Q1 filings in, and that's when the coronavirus hit, not just over in China, but here in the U.S. and Europe. And then the stock market, you know, plunged down there in March. And we had what are now, we know now, at least so far, were the March lows. Everything's popped off of that. But it's good to take a look and see what everybody was doing uh, during that time. We kind of already know one of the more famous uh, money investors, Warren Buffett, and what he was doing at Berkshire because they had their annual meeting and he revealed some of it. And so I did want to cover a little bit more about what he was doing to start off, and then we can go down other tangents because he is one of the few that has come out and just admitted that he did not buy anything. So if you want to say he missed the March lows, yes, I guess he did. <laughs> he, he totally missed that. Um, he's never been a market timer. So, you know, he kind of brushed it off at the annual meeting as like, well, you know, there'll be other buying opportunities is basically what he said. But he didn't buy anything, but he did sell uh, quite a few positions and then continued to sell into April. And now we don't know what he's doing in May, but he did reveal some of the April sales. The April sales included all of his airline stocks. So that'll show up in the second quarter filings. But he did sell all of the Phillips 66 and Travelers in the first quarter, but he had real small stakes in those. I think he got the Phillips 66 when he owned some Conoco Phillips and then they spun it off. And so he got the shares that way. And then he sold almost all of the Goldman Sachs position, which was a little bit interesting. He has just a 0.17% position now. And then he trimmed several other top positions, including JP Morgan and Amazon. They trimmed a little bit of that. Uh, but I was intrigued that his top five positions, and then this is only in the second quarter, so or the first quarter. So we don't know for sure how worse it's gotten now, but his top five positions are now 57% of the Berkshire portfolio. Wow. So super, yeah, so super heavily weighted. And they are Apple, Bank of America, Coke, American Express, and then the Wells Fargo position. And with those three big financials, this is why Berkshire, you know, continues to underperform. But we do know he's, he's continuing to sell some of the banks, I think maybe to lighten that, that financials position, which used to be 55% of the total portfolio, because uh, he had to reveal that he sold some U.S. Bank Corps recently because he was a 10% shareholder in it. So he took that below the 10%, and now we don't know what else he's doing. So we know he's still selling some more of these financial positions here in the second quarter, but didn't buy anything. So he did miss the March lows so far. Yeah, and then, and what's unique about him is that, you know, he doesn't have to, he's so old school and because of his success, he doesn't have to copy the current Wall Street model where they have to buy, you know, the fund managers, yeah. not only do they have to compete with the S&P and each other, but now they're competing with, uh, factor investing and quantitative models that just you know keep you know pouring into certain uh, strategies that go into ETFs and the money managers there's almost like a shortage of, shortage of stock they have to compete for all these things so they're chasing it higher Buffett doesn't have to do any of that so he you know he can take he can do something like have five positions be 50 percent 
57 percent of his portfolio and then sit on 37 billion in cash and say, I don't see anything attractive. Right. Right. Um, I was struck when I looked at a couple other portfolios, what they were doing, and especially with David Tepper, for some reason, I don't know why um, this kind of surprised me, but he's at Appaloosa Management. He's been on CNBC here in the second quarter talking about how the stock market's overvalued now. And, you know, he's evidently not buying. But in the first quarter, he sold some of his energy shares. He sold all of his Caesars, uh, which is CZR, ticker CZR. He sold all of that. He trimmed Google, Amazon, UNH, Facebook, but these weren't big sells. But the ones he did buy, uh, some of them made the news at the time. Um, he bought Tesla, Microsoft, Twitter, Netflix, Qualcomm, and a couple others that you might be kind of surprised about. Wells Fargo was in there. Goodyear Tire, GT is the ticker there. He bought one energy play, Western Midstream Partners. These are all new positions. Um, and then he bought Sprint. And then a couple ETFs. One is the Invesco Senior Loan ETF. BKLN is the ticker there. And then he bought the Utilities ETF, XLU. Um, he also bought some Boston Scientific and HCA Healthcare as new positions. But I was struck by this because he trimmed some of the Alphabet, Amazon, Facebook, and then he bought the rest of the FANG plus Microsoft. And so what's the difference between just owning, you know, I could just buy the triple Qs or something and what he's doing. He's just going into, and clearly this is again, first quarter, everybody was basically trying to dive into these big technology names, right? During the first quarter as it, as the markets plunged down, I feel, you know, Microsoft was like a no brainer, um, Netflix even cause the stay at home thing, uh, even Twitter, because we're all needing to connect some way that way onto the Twitter. So I, I do think a lot of these managers in Q1, while everything was plunging down in February and March, were trying to decide um, the stay at home issue and getting out of, uh, you know, the more like the industrials energy, obviously, as that was getting killed, things like that. Yeah, well, so, and if there was any doubt that they were buying Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon in March, <clears throat> it got confirmed in April and May here. The past six weeks yeah. have seen this incredible chase higher. Um, I In April, I started calling uh, those, you know, mega cap, cash rich, um, cash cows, I started calling them the new flight to safety trade. You know, I okay. mean, how, how much more can you buy of treasury bonds, right? E even right, with the right. e even with the Fed saying, well, we're here forever, the since money managers, you know, the way I compared them to Buffett, you know, they, they have to buy, they can't get left behind. Well, buying Microsoft, Apple, uh, and Amazon is the new flight to safety trade. It's like, I have to yeah. put money somewhere, so I'm just gonna put it in these. And and it makes sense in this sense too. Um, it's not just the, the work at home economy, it's when you ask yourself, who is going to adapt to just about any crisis? I can think th those three companies are gonna adapt, right? I mean, yeah. they're gonna they're gonna adapt their business models, they're gonna go into new markets. They've got the cash war chest to not only uh, survive a bumpy period, but to invest in new areas. So that's why Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon uh, have attracted so much capital, and and a dozen other companies underneath them that uh, you know that may be maybe less of a fortress balance sheet, but have growth opportunities. So I mean, that's why yeah. you know that. That's why I call them the flight to safety trade. You know, some of the stocks that I want to look at today are uh, NVIDIA and Alibaba, both of which I own and both of which report earnings this Thursday. They do. You know, for, yeah. for, for NVIDIA, it's funny because it just launched to new highs um, yesterday and today uh, above 350. 
because now Wall Street analysts are pounding the table. Like like the analyst from uh, BMO just raised his price target from 285 to 425, saying, "Hey, now's the time to buy." And uh, wow. you know, where where were they at 200 dollars in March? Um, Alibaba, the big risk there is who's afraid of China. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little CRISPR stock. I want to talk about Shopify, Boeing, Chipotle, Uber, and maybe Tesla. So let me just show you who was buying NVIDIA. Um, there was really good accumulation overall. Like uh, if I just look at the quarter, uh, among institutions, there was 3% net accumulation. So net buying of 3%. And uh, T. Rowe Price, um, which is a fairly large holder, just boosted their stake to over 10 million shares. They bought, they were the biggest buyer with 3.6 million shares. Uh, BlackRock and Fidelity, of course, you always see them. Like to them, it's a nibble. They bought, they each bought a couple million shares, but they own, you know, 45 million shares each. Um, so that was good to see for NVIDIA. And what, what's funny about NVIDIA is, is, you know, so much, the stock has run up so much here. And they just had their big GTC conference, which is where Jensen Wong gets to say, "Hey, this is the this is the latest stuff coming at you in um, artificial intelligence and you know autonomous vehicles and gaming and all that stuff." So, uh, you know, I wouldn't I would not tell anybody to go out and buy Nvidia here at 360, but I would I would still be a buyer under 350, um, and, it, and it should be a 400 dollar stock, you know maybe later this year. Okay. So let me just talk about the yeah. other big, the, yeah. the other big earnings this week is Alibaba. Um, and they actually saw net selling of about 3% among institutions in, in Q1. And it's, it's funny because we just bought the stock around 195 a couple weeks ago. And I thought, you know, it seems like everybody is, is hating China stocks. They don't want that risk. It's like if they think that the U.S. market is full of unknowns, China must be, you know, have greater unknowns. And so, uh, but uh, but slowly, Baba started creeping up here. And the big news yesterday was from Baidu. I don't know if you saw Baidu's report, but um, no, uh, beaten raise across the board, and that stock's up. Um, you know, almost twenty percent in a couple of days here. And so, Baba is rallying uh, in in conjunction with that. And it, so it kind of shows that, that, you know, China is what, I mean, in terms of their economic shutdown and reopening, they're probably at least a month ahead of us, right? Would you say? Um, at least two months. Okay. At least two months. Yeah. So, so, in, and if we're already seeing that, um, that they're, you know, if, if Baidu is the Google, of China and Alibaba is the Amazon of China. If we already see these businesses bouncing back, um, it shows that you know shows the resilience, obviously, of the of the digital e-commerce economy. Right. Uh, so who is buying Alibaba? Let's see. Uh, it looks like SoftBank bought more, and that could have just been a transfer of shares. Um, yeah, that that was reported in February, so that was actually for Q4. Um, sometimes when I'm looking at this data, I got to make sure I'm looking at. Uh, the most recent. So Nomura took a big new stake. Um, so this is as of uh, May 14th, when the 13Fs were due for Q1. Nomura bought 7.9 million shares of Alibaba, uh, bringing their stake to 8.2 million. So that was that was like the biggest standout buy among institutions uh, for Alibaba, and and I think it's a smart move. I mean this this. The reason I took a stab at it is because I thought we are so close to new highs. If there's any good news out of China, Alibaba is going to make new highs above 230, and and I think we're it's on its way there. And we'll know more Thursday after their report. Okay. What else are you looking at? Um, I took a look at Zoom because you know towards the end of that quarter, that's when everybody started to shut down, and people were realizing that they're going to have to work from home or whatnot. Um, and, you know, people are definitely adding to it. I did notice that uh, nobody has more than 5% of their portfolio in that position, which I guess is a good sign. <laughs> nobody went really crazy over. Right. <laughs> um, I did see that Renaissance Technologies added it 
in the quarter. They're a quant fund. But, um, you know, there was there was buying in it, but it wasn't like overwhelming. I t- also took a look. I did look at Chipotle after you mentioned it to me earlier. OK. And that was that was going to be an interesting play in Q1, because why would I want to own a restaurant? Right. I would not. I would want to get out of that, especially given that the shares had rallied quite a bit into the coronavirus shutdowns. I probably would have been a seller if I owned it. <laughs> I mean, I was getting point. I was getting ready to short Chipotle at 950 because yeah. I thought that the that there was going to be a meat shortage here in the U.S. You know, with with the way that whole cycle went, where they had to euthanize a bunch of animals, and um, and all of a sudden there was going to be a meat shortage. But apparently, you know, uh, investors aren't looking at that. They're looking at more of the opportunity. Of, you know, I saw that uh, Uber in Canada, at least, made a new partnership with them for food delivery. You know, Uber Eats. Okay. Um, so that must be was what's propelling Chipotle to new all time highs here above a thousand. Well, they definitely have gotten their online game together because they've been forced to. Okay. So, you know, they have their own app. They have the loyalty program. They basically are doing what Domino's did several years ago, but they're finally doing it. And then they've been offering free delivery during the shutdowns. And many of their stores have been open with the contact less. You could order on the app and then just go in and pick it up too. So they their sales haven't been awful during yeah. the shutdown. And so, people do, are loyal. And if you get those customers now on that app, after the reopen, you're going to you're going to continue the behavior. Right. So, yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's obviously a quality product. I just thought that the that the American food system was sort of uh, extremely disrupted with and that there could be meat shortages um, and that that would some, you know, it's like if people are already cautious about ordering out, you know, the, the last thing they're going to do is take a chance with, you know, where's the meat coming from? But obviously well, that's not, yeah, that's not maybe. a problem. Well, we don't know because, you know, Wendy's was the one that first had the beef issues and then McDonald's was even starting to see some of the beef issues. And now, you know, the chicken hasn't maybe been as bad. It's all going to depend on if these facilities stay open and are able to get it to the market. And so that is a risk. But a lot of them, like in Shake Shack with the beef side, they said that the beef prices were soaring. Well, I'm sure Chipotle is seeing all, you know, a surging of commodity prices, even as far as something like avocados. I don't know what the price on those are doing right now. But are you getting them out of Mexico at all? I, maybe not. I don't know. Where do they get them? They might source them out of California. But but even still, like there's you still you you have a lot of the same labor issues. And so the costs are going to go up on all this. But um, so far, you know, a lot of them are, I don't know, maybe even able to pass it along, <laughs> possibly. Yeah. I mean, so, the. Uh- if, if I was going to bet on anybody adapting to it quickly and smartly, it would be a company like Chipotle. Uh, let me just take a look at the at the buying here. So in Q1, uh, there was 4% net buying. So that, that's a positive sign. And some of the bigger buyers were uh, T. Rowe Price adding 1.6 million shares, which is, which is almost a new position because, uh, yeah, they only had, yeah, they only had like 100,000 shares. So that's, that's okay. interesting. Um, and then Capital World Investors. This is one of my favorite uh, sort of under the radar giant fund managers out in California, uh, the Capital Group. They started a new position of about 295,000 shares uh, in okay. Q1. So they obviously saw something they liked. Maybe they were buyers um, in, you know, in the meltdown. Because what did Chipotle go down to? God, did it really go down to, uh, it went down below $500 in, yeah, in March. So, so yeah. that, yeah, I mean, I would love to see the timing on some of these buys and I bet you right. capital group was, pr- I mean, I don't know. It, it's hard to say. We, we don't know if they were the smart money buying at, at 500 in March or if they were buying the new highs above 900 in February. <laughs> I don't know, right? That, that's, that's one thing the, we don't know when we look history. at the 13Fs. <laughs> right. We all like to think like, oh, they were the ones who jumped in <laughs> in the March. But 
I mean, things were going good. It, you were willing to pay for the growth in February at those highs with a lot of these stocks. So some of them might have been caught, you know, buying a little too early, maybe. Um, Chipotle, though, is trading at 130 times its forward now because those earnings estimates are wow. are being slashed. But this yeah. is the problem I have with a lot of these. Like, yeah, business isn't as bad as everybody thought. And it will start coming back as we have the reopens and they can reopen stores and all of that. And the consumer feels safer to go out to the restaurants and whatnot. Um, but how much are you willing to pay for it? That's the yeah. question. How quickly does it all come back? You know, if we only have the earnings slammed this year, Maybe I don't mind paying this elevated price for next year's earnings, but I don't know. Are those are those going to be there? I don't know. It's too early for me to know yet. But it's too it's a little too too expensive for my value blood for that okay. one. How, how about uh, get a lot. how about a, a an e-commerce company trading at forty times sales? Are you interested? Oh, which one is that? <laughs> that would be Shopify. <laughs> Shopify, oh. Sh Shopify at seven hundred and fifty dollars. Um, that's um, uh, what did I say? Um, yeah, they got about. Are they going to do like two billion in sales this year? I got to take a look here again. But um, forty times sales. Yeah, almost. Yeah, depending on what you look wow. at. Um, People are but, complaining that. Microsoft set like 10 times sales or 13 times sales. Right. And said, <laughs> then you have this one. Okay. So what, but they are a play on work from home and ordering everything online, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the market cap at, at 750 bucks uh, per share, uh, the market cap is about just over 85 billion. And uh, their sales for this year, I think, are just over two billion. Yeah, they're going to do 2.1 billion this year, and projected 2.8 billion for next year. So on a forward basis, it's more like 35 times sales. Is that better? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm excited to see that. Uh, now, I mean, the stock it's almost like Chipotle in terms of you know big reaction lower, and they scooped it up. And guess who shows up again? Just like in Chipotle. Capital World Investors, um, okay. who manages together with a capital group manages over 500 billion. They're based out of LA, and they're very quantitative. They have a, a lot of smart managers who use a lot of different quantitative models, and so they jumped into more Shopify. They already owned about three million shares, and they bought another 1.9 million in Q1. Okay. Uh, Morgan Stanley added a million shares. To their stake now they hold 5.3 million and just double checking yeah these are all q1 so um th that was some smart money there uh jumping into shopify when they could at uh, let's see what what shopify did i mean shopify it, it it made new highs in february just like the market up to 550 comes down to 350 and now it's trading 750 so anything that anybody bought in q1 um you know, between 350 and 550, uh, they're doing very well on as that as that yeah. e-commerce platform. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a disruptor, and it's like, are they going to disrupt Amazon? No, but can they take market share from that space that Amazon has created? Of course. Yeah. What else are you yeah, looking but at? But how much you pay, willing to pay for it? That's my question. Right. With a lot I, of these, that, they have rebounded, and but earnings are yeah. not. Not good. These and growth so, managers have to be in something, though. So if, if there's I cash know. coming in, they're not going to sit on 10% cash. I know. Yeah. Um, all right. Did I, you want to look, look at Boeing? Boeing. Uh, yeah. my, I wanted to see, like, because there's got to be there's got to be some a bloodbath in Boeing for a lot of fund managers who, you know, owned it above 300 and then thought, well, I'll add more at 200 and then I'll add more at 100. And <laughs> right. Right. But uh, isn't that the regular mom and pop investors doing that too? Because there's been mean, such a belief yeah. in Boeing and it's been such a staple of people's portfolios and they've gotten rich off of it over the last 10 years. Yeah. And I mean, we, so you and I have spent the past year talking about um, you know, what the death of the 737 does yeah. to their business. And and we didn't see this coming, certainly, the uh, oh. you know, air travel getting benched. I saw um, 
who did I see? Oh, Delta benched all their triple sevens. I'm sure yeah. you saw that. I mean, they're like, hey, we, 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 there's no market to fly these big planes anymore. <laughs> right. So when does that come back? Well, any of that. I mean, if you had the 737 MAX on order, do you need it now? No. Right. And United right. canceled all of its MAXs, didn't it? The ones they have not got delivered. Didn't they say, no, we're not, even, yeah. we don't even need those for years. So I don't know who's, mm -hmm. is anyone going to take delivery of it when, if, if they can get it back up into the air? I don't know. Like that's a whole nother yeah, thing. And just that, I mean, we could do a whole show just on how does travel change because yeah. of, of coronavirus. Um, totally. You know, it, it you know, maybe maybe it's back to where it was in three years, but that's a long yeah. if you're in that business, that's a long time to wait, isn't it? Yes, that's forever. Yeah. So looking at uh, I'm going to look at the sellers first in uh, okay. in, T, uh, in Boeing. So for Q1, T. Rowe Price was a fairly large holder. They had over 30 million shares. They sold over 10 million. So okay. to them, oh. it was like Q1 was a time to be getting out. And I'm not sure how quickly did the did the, the stock had already really, I mean, the stock was still holding on to, to three, 325 in February. Yeah. And then yeah. that's when it just fell off a cliff. Right. Um, so who knows where they dumped that. Um, and let's see if there were some buyers. Um Let's see. Well, Capital World, interestingly enough, Capital. Okay, wow. so here, so Capital World again is a very large holder. They added four million shares, um, and now hold thirty million shares. So you know they're the type of diversified fund that they could have. You know, a, a model that says we can bet on Boeing for the long term. You know, and maybe right. that's maybe that's partly aerospace and defense too. Yeah. Um, I want to see. I want to just look at the largest holders here, which are, are going to be your Vanguard and your BlackRock. Vanguard and BlackRock did not do much, considering that they, you know, they hold anywhere from thirty-five to forty million shares. They, they barely did anything. Um, and so, I'm trying to find a like a name here that we know, besides all these giant, you know, pension funds and that sort of thing. Um, Nothing, nothing else really stands out. Um, okay. Obviously, um, you know, there's going to be smaller funds and ETFs and moms and pops who got hurt and yeah. who, who may just say, oh, man, it, you know, Boeing's it's not going to be back to three hundred dollars, you know, in the next two years. And, right? and they're just calling it quits now. Uh, yeah. But ob obviously, the biggest institutions don't care. They're like, you know, we can right. we can buy this and hold it for another five years. Easy. Right. That's the difference between the yeah. two, for sure. So, I mean, if we, it would be interesting to see what's happened to analyst estimates for Boeing in terms of revenue. Like, because the 737 was going to, you know, there were, uh, there were thousands on back order, right? That created this huge backlog that was going to uh, be worth, you know, tens of billions of sales in the next 10 years. How right. much of that, how much of that got cut back? And does it at some point become a value stock trading at a hundred dollars? I don't know. Maybe I'm going to, I would keep it on my radar, but only once we figure out what is even happening with the max, nobody, I mean, there's right. other things that are bigger issues right now, but we are going into June and there's no indication that the plane is going to be, you know, recertified by like August or even September. Which is yeah. what they originally thought it would be. Yeah, and obviously traffic. nobody needs it again. Nobody exactly. needs yeah. it, so I mean, they it, don't. It, yeah, maybe it's more attractive than a triple seven, you know, for shorter hauls. But you know, even those, the volume of those is severely impacted right now. Right, right. I want to talk about my little CRISPR stock, uh, Intelia Therapeutics. NTLA is one of the smaller of the the three CRISPR stocks, okay. and. Um, it's just, it's the, the stock is rocketed 50% higher just in the month of May here. And I think a large part of that, it, um, the, there's nothing really new in the pipeline that we didn't know already about what they're submitting for new drug applications or anything like that. 
um, or, or progress in clinical trials. I think it's mainly that there was one big buyer, and that, once again, is ARC Investment Management. And I've talked about the ARC funds before. That's yeah. uh, Kat, Kathy Wood. Um, some of the ETF symbols there are would be ARC-G for uh, genomics. They are, um, their whole thesis is they want to invest in disruptive technologies. And so they've, they've sort of created a new model. They don't care what the rest of, they're not competing with the West, rest of Wall Street. They just want to buy innovative, disruptive companies that are creating the future. And so, of course, these are the, Kathy Wood, these are the same people who have the $7,000 price target on Tesla. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. As an example of, uh, you know, disruptive innovation. And so they love the CRISPR stocks as well. And they bought another 1.5 million shares of NTLA to bring to make them the largest holder with now 10.2 million shares. Um, okay. And I think I think their conviction there, once it was revealed, is what what launched the stock back up here. Okay. So that was exciting for me to see. I was. Yeah. Now, I was, what's uh, the market cap on that one? Oh gosh, I mean. We know. Last time I looked, it was only a billion. It might be two okay. billion now. <laughs> okay. But let me take a look here. Yeah, so it's, it's it's one of the smaller ones. And this, you know, this this CRISPR stuff. This is this is you know experimental R and D. They're you know we're a long way f away from any revenues other than just from collaborations. So um, how do, where do they get their funding from? Like so uh, uh, one place they get it from is from their what I call their big brothers. And, you know, the big, you okay. always need a, in pharma, you always need a big brother, a big cap biopharma who invests in you and then pays you for milestones in uh, pipeline R&D. Um, I just wanted to check the market cap here real quick for NTLA. Uh, but Regeneron is the big brother here for, Okay. Uh, let me just double check and make sure that they still have their holding. Yeah, Regeneron bought uh, 2.8 million shares back in 2016. Okay. And they and they still hold them. They haven't done anything with them. So okay. that was like, you know, Regeneron is like one of the big five or six biotech companies up there with Gilead and Amgen and Vertex. And so when somebody like that invests in your technology, it's usually a pretty good sign. Yeah. Uh, so... And then just double check in the the market cap here for uh, NTLA. I want to see what it's done. But um, the, you know, yeah, I mean, the market cap now is still only just under a billion, even with even with the fifty percent rise. So I didn't realize how cheap okay. it had gotten. And yeah. uh, I had, you know, we had owned it. Um, you know, we you know, buy it at 13, watch it go to 25 and then all the way back to 13. You know, th those are the heartbreak roller coasters of biotech. <laughs> right. <laughs> and more, of, more than a few of those. Yes. 100% gain. I know all about those. And then back to flat. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. want to talk about Novavax? You were a big Novavax fan for a while. And that's been, that's been uh, a darling of the recent okay. crisis, right? Yes, indeed. I did a podcast on Novavax a couple of years ago after I sold it. And now it has come to my attention. I need to do another podcast because it is surging, but the story isn't as dire for me as right. you might think. <laughs> but I did sell it when uh, their main uh, flu drug just was not, not working. It failed the phase three and then they tried again and it was like kind of working with the elderly and pregnant women, I think, but then it was going to be a couple more years. They were going to have to do another phase, all this. And that's like a reminder whenever I hear, you know, about the phases that we're going through now for the vaccine for the coronavirus, I have the flashbacks to uh -huh. what happened with Novavax with their flu vaccine. And obviously Novavax is is in the hunt for a vaccine for the coronavirus as well, because that is their field of expertise. They have gotten very close on other types of flu vaccines. So I hope one of them does get something here, obviously. Um, but it shows you how difficult it is, even if you pass 
you know, phase one and phase two, think everything's going super good for phase three, and then it doesn't, like, it still may not work. So, but yeah, Novavax is one of the, one of the go-getters of this year for 2020, obviously. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we covered quite a bit. I did want to bring up one other thing that um, I did take a look at David Einhorn at Greenlight Capital just to kind of see what he did in the first quarter. And uh, he had some interesting sells. He did liquidate a bunch of positions and then he did buy a bunch of new positions. And I feel like what he did is more akin to what many of us maybe had been doing as well with our own portfolios. So he sold out of all of his General Motors, for instance. He just got out of all of that finally. Um, he sold out of Console Energy. And then he rotated into what I would consider to be the more safety names. If you have this big plunge, the economy shutting down, where do you go? You go into like healthcare um, and maybe even cigarettes <laughs> because he bought Altria, ticker MO, <laughs> uh, in the first quarter. That would have been the old like safety, like that's the sin play, right? Like we're still going to be sinners and we're still going to have to buy those cigarettes or the alcohol or whatever, even if we're in shutdown. So you go into the how about How about especially if we're in shutdown, right? Because people have right, more time on their hands. They're at, they're at home. They don't have to worry about stepping out of the office to have a smoke. <laughs> well, for sure. And we do know from some of the, the store data that alcohol has been a big seller as well, as well as cannabis, actually, too. So um, so he did go into that. He did buy um, Danaher. Uh, DHR is the ticker there, and that was down 20% in March and now is up 4% year to date. That's medical diagnostics and all that. He did buy some Centene, again, health insurance. That makes some sense. And then he had one interesting uh, buy that most people probably don't know, never heard of, and it's Crown Holdings, ticker CCK, and that is packaging and containers, which you might think, yes, we are now ordering everything and it has to be shipped to my house in that Amazon box or that Walmart box. So that has been a good play for him. We don't know exactly when he bought in the quarter, but it was down 39% at the lows in March and now is down only 12% year to date. So um, some interesting kind of more defensive plays I feel like he went into. He also bought some Berkshire Hathaway for the first time as well. That's a huge defensive play, right? You're just basically yeah. saying, I'm going into the safety. They have cash. I'm going in there. <laughs> like, that's it. Uh, but that's more like akin to what I feel like a lot of us were doing. We might have been too scared to get into the Shopify. We're not quant models. You know, we don't we don't just have that running. We have the emotions at play. And when we see those big declines in some of these big growth names, it's a, it's real hard to get in when you see the sell offs like that, oh, even yeah. if, you know, they're good companies. It's just it's hard emotionally, as you know, because this is what you yeah. cover. All and and yeah. this is something that you and I have talked bef about before uh, during corrections is is have a plan so that because if you know what you want to buy, if you like have a shopping list and say and you just sort of ask yourself, gee, uh, where would I love to buy Tesla or Shopify? And then, you know, and let's say it's trading 750 and you go to your, and you say to yourself, gee, I'd love to buy it at 400. Well, that sounds like a dream when it's trading at 750, right? Yeah. But if you yeah. do that exercise in advance of a correction, then when the correction comes, you're much more likely to follow through on the plan because you you said part of that voice is going to be in your head. You're going to go, well, I said I would love to buy it here. And, you know, am I going to am I going to let the fear and the noise, you know, uh, you know, overrule my my original plan, my and, you know, sort of drown out what would be a great long term exercise. So that's yeah. why that's why having a plan for any correction is good because it it you're much more likely to follow through and buy something and and not let the fear and the noise get to you. Right, right. For sure. Okay, so this was a good a good episode about who is getting in what and if they got those March lows or not. 
And it's going to be interesting again to see the second quarter, what they're doing here. Are they going to be David Tepper not doing anything or not much of anything because he sees, thinks it's overvalued? What's going to be, what's going to be happening? We don't know because it's not the end of the second quarter yet. And a lot can happen in the stock market um, until we get there. But yeah, it's interesting to see what the professionals are doing in these times of crisis. So let me recap the tickers again. There were a lot in this episode, so this won't really cover all of them, but the main ones we talked about were um, Zoom, ticker ZM. Do not buy Zoom, Z-O-O-M. It's ZM. <laughs> uh, they really should put a disclaimer on that one. ZM is the ticker. Microsoft, obviously, MSFT. We talked a little bit about Goldman Sachs, GS. NVIDIA, of course, NVDA. Alibaba is BABA. Chipotle is CMG. Shopify is Shop, S-H-O-P. Um, the CRISPR stock is NTLA. Then we had the Crown um, Packaging Company, CCK. Centina is CNC. Altria is MO. Berkshire Hathaway, BRK, dot B or dot A. If you, if you really want to go for it, go for those A shares. General Motors is GM. And we Mentioned console energy, C-E-I-X is the ticker there. And then we mentioned, obviously, all the fangs, but everybody knows those tickers, so I'm not going to go over all those. Um, so, yeah, if you want to get more updates on what all the fund managers and and uh, the big institutions are buying, we're going to be covering it here in future episodes because it's, it's definitely heated up again. And so you don't want to miss a single episode of The Market Edge. You can get us on SoundCloud. And I know a lot of you are over there now subscribing. And you can also subscribe on Spotify and we're on Apple Podcasts. But be sure to get us somewhere. And I'll see you again next week with some more stocks. This material is being provided for informational purposes only. And nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's Investment Research as a whole.